Lionel Johnson was the Primarch of the First Legion of the 20 founding legions of the Imperium. He's commander of the Dark Angels and he has this pretty crazy and torrid history filled with honor and this great deal of secrecy and, and a lot of like infighting with a lot of his brothers. So with the new Dark Angels Codex just around the corner and a lot of you guys asked me to expand on some of my 40k knowledge, I figured this is as good a time as uh, any really to start with the Master of the, the First Legion. And this is another new series of videos I'll be doing here focusing on the Primarchs of all 18, and as we only know, 18 Primarchs, so only of, the, of all 18 Legions, and their subsequent placements uh, after the, the Horus Heresy. Think of this as kind of like the Index Astartes that used to be in the, in the White Dwarf. I'm actually going to say Index Astartes. That's the way I like to say it. I don't like to say Index Astartes like I see in uh, a lot of the games. But um, it's just like the Index Astartes, only not. So before we get into the history of the lion himself, we have to jump back into a quick prehistory leading up to this point. And <clears throat> this, is, this is really to give a complete outside background on the situation. And this is assuming that you don't know anything about the Warhammer 40,000 universe. So I'm going to do a quick little blurb here on, on the, kind of the, the, the setting of the pre-primarchs. So this kind of, so all of this really takes place, uh, or the Horus Heresy, the Great Crusade, all the primarchs takes place in the 30th millennium. So a whopping 27,000 years ahead of our timeline now, as we live in the third millennium. So the Emperor of Man, uh, being a being that is kind of impossibly old and is combined from these spirits of many powerful psychic uh, attuned individuals that all gave their lives at one moment to create this one singular soul and enter entity they kind of said to themselves hey we know the evil that's coming we are getting eaten when we die and we go into the warp because we used to be able to revitalize ourselves and, re and resurrect ourselves we're all dying and getting eaten by the demons in the warp we have to make something that can fight this so bam they actually all commit like ritual suicide, basically, and create the emperor. And he's been walking the the, the earth for, for thousands and thousands of years in, in secrecy. So the emperor, emperor man, though, kind of comes to the fore in like the 25th millennium or so and unifies all of humanity at the end of what's called the Age of Strife in the Unification Wars. Uh, and the Age of Strife is basically a... Um, well, humanity was a, a once this like huge star-faring civilization, and it had been cut off from all of its empire due to what was called the Old Night, and that's a series of what are, are these um, called warp storms that hinder travel out of system. So, that this is the this is the Age of Strife, and the Emperor then begins work on his Primarch project just after he unifies all of Terra and kind of start this new golden age the precursor to the to the great crusade and he creates a race of genetically enhanced super soldiers called space marines and the uh the chaos gods are you know the same chaos gods we see in warhammer or total war warhammer if you're joining me from that little series of, of uh books or i'm sorry uh, uh games um but they, they intercede and jettison all of the 20 primarchs across the galaxy um and so really here begins our story and the story of, of every primarch is from this point on um, each one of their own legions is made in their in their image with pieces of their genetic code imprinted into what is called their uh, gene seed, into every space marine's gene seed. So thus starts the tale of the master of the first legion, Lion L. Johnson. So in order to get a good idea from this, we have to take a step. Where, where, where did he land? So while Lion is the master of the first legion he was not the first primarch to be found that honor went to horus he would and who we'll talk about more in time and he'll always be mentioned as we go through this but the lion landed on the death world of caliban and many of the worlds in the imperium have certain designations death world forge worlds uh, agra worlds etc um, you can imagine what would comp uh, uh, comprise a death world so hostile vegetation uh, indigenous wildlife that is also hostile or a climate condition that is hostile so essentially it's a world you're going to die on by any manner of of reasons that the world itself can create so caliban was once part of the former empire of man and as thus it still has a lot of the technology from what is called the, the dark ages of technology and it's funny because it's not the dark age of technology because it's bad it's the dark age of technology because just like our dark ages they forgot about all the fucking technologies i don't know where it is anymore so it was a much more advanced time that they can't find they, they keep 
finding these standard uh, construction templates. It keeps finding all these things from the dark age of technology that empowers and, and, and revitalizes the age that they're currently in. So it's really kind of this weird reverse um, fall of technology. It's kind of crazy, but as, as advanced as they all are. So imagine this kind of verdant world filled with castles, knights in this proto power armor. It's, a, it's this power armor that precursors what they're, what they're use um, in the 30th millennium, the, the mark, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine power armor, whichever one it is that time. With uh, the precursors to bolt guns and chain swords, and they all they all ride these kind of enhanced horses, and they fight these chaos warped beasts that they call uh, great beasts. And it's pretty pretty metal, right? So during this time, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of forearm grabbing, brother shouting in loud tones, you know, and riding off to war. That that kind of like brother, like very knightly orders. And so the older Inexistardus books uh, didn't really overly describe this time. It just kind of says, oh, he landed on Caliban, uh, he joined a knightly order, yada, yada, yada. Nothing really ex extensive. But since the Horus Heresy has come out, the Horus Heresy series, we have a much better idea of what this time looked like in Lionel Johnson's life. Uh, for, for 10 long, torturous years, Lion was in the forests of Caliban completely alone. I mean, he landed and boom, he's there, he's, he's alone. We don't find out until later in the timeline that this was really a time when he was constantly tempted and lured to the uh, the dark side i mean to chaos corruption by the the, the ruinous powers and he tells conrad kurz uh and conrad kurz is the primarch of the night lords uh, but later on that they they inhabited his dreams his thoughts and were constantly really beckoning him and it's pretty ca it's pretty crazy because no other primarch has really gone through that that crucible of faith that lion had to go through and we'll talk about the, the Night Lords, Dark Lords dichotomy towards the end here. But this is this is definitely worth bringing up, you know, because he kind of, he even tells Conrad when Conrad tries to tempt him later on down the line. He goes, you know, hey, service is good enough for me. That's the reward I need. And even before he knew who the Emperor was, he was already turning his, his face away from this. And it's just, a, it's a very interesting point because while, while, in the books you're reading it, you don't know a ton about it, and when you find out later in the history that he says, hey, this, this, these are the things that shaped me. Um, but at the end of this time, Sar Luther discovers the young boy and, and brings him back to the Monastery of the Order, and there they name him Lion L. Johnson, or Lion, Son of the Forest. You know, L. Johnson, Son of the Forest, whatever, makes sense. Um, the entirety of Caliban, though, is, is ruled by over by this feudal system of knights, hence the Tsar name, the, the Tsar title uh, affixed to Luther. And there are multiple knightly orders, all of which have their own lords and knights and adjoining towns, so on and so forth. But they go on these kind of grand hunts to kill these great beasts, these chaos beasts that inhabit the forest and that the planet is, is primarily comprised of. Chief of these monsters, though, is the great... Calibanite and lion, which look nothing like lions at all, save a mane, save like a mane of uh, razor sharp kind of spines that they shoot, they shoot out from them, they shoot them, it's crazy. They, they almost, the book kind of describes them like manticores uh, without wings, and not being like lions. It's kind of it, they because their 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 skin is like rock hard scalish type. It's almost like a dragon mixed with a manticore. It's kind of weird, but safe to say Caliban is a veritable terror nest of grim dark Cthulhu baddies and uh, chaos warp hell. So after being rescued and inducted into the order, Lion quickly rose in the ranks until eventually becoming the supreme mas grand master of the order. Now, this is a repeating trend that we're going to see with a lot of the primarchs we're going to talk about. They come to maturation much faster than normal humans and can learn and process information much, much, much faster. They have eidetic memories, all sorts of this crazy stuff. And it, it, that's inherent in all space marines, but it's like turned up to 12 or uh, primarchs. And like most primarchs, when they talk about when they fight, they're going faster than even space marines can keep up with. And they're like constantly cutting each other and their wounds are knitting them like almost immediately. So they're, they're pretty crazy beings. But they always excel to surpass their, um, they always kind of manage to, to surpass their adoptive fathers, their surrogate fathers. And there's this really great point in Descent of Angels where Lion goes out to kill a Calibanite lion and is ambushed, wounded, then eventually rounds about and kills it. And again, this is, he's a, he's a Primarch, so he can kind of take, a, take quite a beating. But he even counters the Watchers in the Dark and at this time. And that's someone or something that we'll talk more about later. But it's worth bringing up that even this early in Lion's history, he encounters the Watcher of the Dark, which are these kind of robed, very enigmatic, um, mysterious figures that are 
um, quite powerful, but they're very, they allude to an even bigger power that, that they're not even really given form to in, in a lot of the lore or the books just yet. We, we know that they might be members of what is called the Cabal, which is this kind of grand cosmic force that works against chaos at whatever the cost may be. But <clears throat> they do have a, they play a larger role in Lion, in the, land, the end of Lion's uh, kind of story here. But they're worth bringing up here. But this is where the, really the, the first seeds of jealousy start to crop up in Luther, uh, his surrogate father. And it's, as he's pretty jealous of how far the lion has come in such a short amount of time. You know, he's killed a Calvinite lion, which, is, which takes a whole order to go and kill. And he did it almost single-handedly. Um, he's risen to the rank of Supreme Grand Master well above even Luther. Luther is now his right hand, even though Luther's older than him, technically. So there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, resentment going on here, but the two, the two really complement each other. You know that they, they're very, they work very well despite this kind of um, mounting rift. And um, it's, it's really important to, to note how that kind of works out with their, with their person, their personalities. Lion is this cold, calculated, and tactical, uh, while being outright stubborn in his chosen path type individual. You know. And, and it's pretty crazy because because um, Luther kind of like nails it. He says, "Hey, you know, you you kind of seem removed from everyone, like 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 you're a step above." And in in the book, there's here's a little quote from it. Imagine what it must be like to be so. And this is the lion saying it, kind of like reflecting exactly on what Luther says. Imagine what it must be like to be so singular a creature, knowing that you are alone and that there will never be more of you. These beasts were not driven by hunger, they are insane, driven to madness by their own uniqueness. Talking about the great beasts of uh, Caliban. But he's basically saying like, yeah, you're kind of right, Luther. I am kind of removed from people because it's, it's because I don't know how to really relate to them. I feel like I am removed. And a lot of the same ways that the, the Emperor of Man feels when we hear about the Emperor's voice from the, the, the book, The Emperor of Mankind. <laughs> but... Um, Luther, on the other hand, is charismatic, he's boisterous, he's brave, you know, he's, he's a leader of men. And so both men have a very strict code of honor and conduct that they follow. I know they're, they're knights after all, but these, these two kind of use each other's personality traits to fill the gaps that the others have created. So, you know, why, why a lion can't necessarily rouse all the orders to his banner in a kind of uh, um, charismatic way, Luther can. So that's really what happened. Luther and Lion unite the entire planet, all of them falling under the order, quote unquote, that's what it's called. That's the name of this nightly order is the order, kind of original, right? To eradicate all the uh, great beasts on the planet, as well as um, the order of Lupus. And they go to eradicate the order of Lupus here because it's another nightly order that actually is using the beasts to their own means. So they're like, no, no, no. You're corrupted. You're going down. So they basically uh, take out everything. They take out. They, they eliminate the threat of these beasts, which have, which is um, kind of uh, 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 resided over this planet for a good deal of time. They, they knock out the, the order of Luther at the same time. But shortly after this, you, the Emperor of Man lands on Caliban, and he finds that the leader of the planet was none other than his first, his lost son and master of the First Legion, Lionel Johnson, obviously. So Lionel Johnson then renames the Legion after a Caliban myth, and, and Luther actually outright says it uh, as soon as he sees the assault packs of these space marines kind of fall down or um, descend on the earth. He says, And the angels of darkness descend, descended upon pinions of fire and light, the great and terrible dark angels. So he, so Lionel Johnson then names them after this Caliban myth, the dark angels. So this is where things get pretty dicey in the hierarchy of the, of the order. You know, to become a space marine, you have to be under a certain age for your body to be able to sustain the growth triggered by the gene seeds and all the surgery that introduces all the new organs, etc., into the body. So <clears throat> this was obviously not the case with a lot of the older members of the order, including, of course, Uther, or I'm sorry, Luther. They were instead genetically enhanced, sort of uh, these kind of demi-space marines. And this is the same treatment Corferon received in the Word Bearers Legion, another kind of surrogate father to another Primarch. And there's a lot of talk at this point, you know, right, right before the Great Crusade gets going about how the Mechanicum essentially levels mountains and forests to make way for the progress of all this necessary accoutrement of a space marine founding planet. So you, you see a lot of these knights kind of lamenting, like, I remember before this, uh, we didn't have all this, this kind of fire and industry come to our lands and, and level everything. 
So this kind of builds some resentment. This leaves a bitter taste in a lot of the older knights' mouths. And this kind of further um, cements those seeds of discontent as they kind of blossom more and more as, as more of this under, under um, unfolds. But a young uh, knight, Zahariel, he foils a plot by some of the more zealous knights that we were just talking about to destabilize the plans of growth and assassinate the emperor. So Zahariel kind of steps in and, and, and essentially rats them out. So this kind of quells the resistance on Caliban. And after that, Lionel Johnson sets out to the stars with uh, both his surrogate and his gene father, so Luther and the emperor. The Dark Angels quickly become a figurehead amongst the other legions as an idyllic legion with it with this kind of this this rigid hierarchy just like there was in their order this discipline and very effective tactics and this was the very first legion created by the emperor so they really had a lot of clout here they, they were used as, as more or less the standard of how a, a legion of how a effective tactical force should be and they were broken up into uh, six hosts all with uh, different specializations. There was the Dreadwing, which was kind of focused on total war, all aspects of fighting from the Space Marines. The Stormwing, which was focused more on assault, assault-based Marines and the such. The Ravenwing, which was more of a motorized kind of um, heavy attack bikes and, and bikes of uh, many variations. The Iron Wing, which is their armored wing. <laughs> I'm so funny. Uh, the Fire Wing, which was, again, uh, actually unknown. We don't know a ton about what comprised the fire wing. I would assume it has something to do with uh, both plasma and or fire or melted technology. And lastly, the death wing, the elite Terminator filled uh, wing of the uh, of the wing, uh, the host of the Legion. In, in fact, we only ever see a after the Horus Heresy, we only see that the Raven wing and the death wing remain. The other wings kind of get uh, dismantled and uh, forgotten about because they get inducted into the other two. But as Lion waged his war, he was pulled to the planet of Sarosh to replace the white scars there. And the Saroshi government was, was kind of saying, oh, yeah, no, mm -hmm. we're ready to comply. Let's negotiate. Let's, let's fall into compliance. Let's become part of the Imperium. This, this was a ruse, a farce. So after they board the, the ship that both the Emperor and the Lion Ron, the Soroshi Lord uh, High Executor, exchanges some not so pleasant words, so, so the ruler of the Soroshi. Um, and as time has really told us, Space Marines are not ones to take insults on the other cheek when it comes to their master of the golden toilets. So Lion splits this dude in two from groin to chin as soon as he starts uttering insults at the Emperor. And the real kicker is that he had brought a nuke with him on the ship. Something that Luther and the aforementioned Zariel that we've talked about earlier discover. Now, Zariel's a pretty consummate Dark Angel or a pretty consummate Space Marine in general. He's embroiled in all these kind of shitty side plots, and it's because of his really his naivete and his willingness to really do good. So Luther, on the other hand, has to be kind of talked off the edge by Zariel, and Luther is eventually convinced convinced to jettison that nuke outside of the ship, and the detonates outside in space causes minor damage to the ship, not a big deal. But this really kind of does minor damage to the ship, but it does major damage to the relationship between Lion and Luther. He sends Luther back to Caliban with the rest of his uh, forces. Like, I think it's something like, um, like I want to say it's like 500 Dark Angels or something like that. And tells him, okay, hey, you, you are sent back there in shame. You go recruit for the Legion. And this would really be the last time these two talk as brothers, you know, a conversation and an action that the lion eventually really, he confesses to this actually being a big regret of his, because he kind of, he, there's a lot of, uh, um, a lot of a, a kind of a split in his brain. Like, yes, he, he does this as one part punishment, but as another part, like, I trust you to, inv to imbue the vision of the Legion going forward. And I'm sure it was not conveyed that way, because the lion is a very, uh, taciturn dick of an individual so i'm sure it was like hey you go back there you're 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 in trouble you go in that corner mister rather than being like hey you have i'm sending you back here because you pissed me off but also because i know you are the best man for the job had, it, had that happened i'm sure it would have gone a lot differently but amongst a few other kind of exploits here uh, and i don't want to get into too many of the little nitty-gritty of what happens in the horus heresy i mainly want to stick along what happens with 
um, Lionel Johnson, even despite some of his kind of covert little side missions that happen. But before the Horus Heresy breaks out, uh, Lionel Johnson is um, uh, kind of not the best of friends with Lehman Russ. In, in current day 40k lore, the Space Wolves and the Dark Elves really, or Dark Elves, Dark, Dark Angels, <laughs> now that I've said every single race, um, hate each other. And there's this time where they were, they were, they're willing to fight together, but it's mostly begrudgingly and it's really for the greater good. They even have honor duels each time both armies need to share the field. So it's kind of like a, hey, remember that time that our Primarchs fought? You, you're your best champion, my just best champion. We're going to duke it out and it's going to be just like the same thing. I'm going to wear a really cool wolf headdress and you're going to have wings on your head. But essentially on the planet of Dulan, the leader called Lehman Russ the Emperor's lapdog. And this promptly pissed off the space thane, and he went in for a thorough ass kicking. But before Lehman Russ could even get there, Lionel Johnson teleported to the leader's, leader's chamber and executed him right as Russ showed up. And you know Russ is all about grudges, kind of like the Dawi, and he's all about honor. So this this broke out into a fist fight that ended in, in Johnson tossing Russ through a table. And you know Russ being the, the, this kind of space Viking kind of stood up and was laughing it off he's like this this was this was ridiculous look at us we're brothers we're fighting over this this is, this is silly lionel johnson did not take it that way he took it as oh you're mocking me screw you punches russ knocks him out cold takes the space marines leaves the leaves the entire system that uh that's another bad taste in russ's mouth so that kind of begets their whole feud their whole issue with each other now there's one other thing before we really get into the meat of the Horus Heresy. Uh, the Lionel Johnson was passed up for title of the War Master, and that's kind of a bit of contention for him because he saw himself as um, the most likely to be the War Master. Oh, in fact, he was surprised that I wasn't even Sanguinius because they always say Sanguinius is the most like the Emperor in so many ways, even in, in embodiment and in, in um, actual physicality, and he's got wings. So... He didn't take it poorly, but he didn't take it well. He wasn't like, oh, you know what? Horus deserves it. Good job on him. He was like, well, okay, if that's what the Emperor wants. You know, just kind of that bitter stepchild kind of attitude. But it causes a lot of weird tension between Horus and the Lion, who, who weren't like firm friends to begin with. But, and that's another important fact. Lion's not a friend with anyone for the most part. We talked about how he feels he's, he's one step above people and kind of removed from the equation. Sanguinius might be the only one who can really even talk to him on somewhat of, a, of, an, of an equal footing, and he, Sanguinius can do that with almost any Primarch. He's like everyone's best friend next to Horus. If it's like Horus is like everyone's meaner older brother, but also kind of just has some tough love, Sanguinius is the one everyone really likes and always wants to talk to. But um, the War Master thing kind of didn't sit well with him. So when the Horus Heresy breaks out and Isvan 5 happens, and, or Isvan 3, then Isvan 5 happens, the Lion is already kind of a little like, oh, okay, yeah, see, told you guys, told you that Horus would do, would do all this action. So he kind of gets involved with the Night Haunter, with, with Conrad Kurz, with the, the Night Lords. And he doesn't have a direct interface with the Emperor like a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the primarchs don't don't get that they don't get to help the emperor in the in the holy siege of terra because of the machinations of the Horus heresy um he's Horus has brought a whole half of the legion onto his side to fight or i'm sorry a whole half of the legions to fight in his name and he dispatches conrad kurz to keep the the lionel johnson away from terra and this begins what's called the, the thermos crusade in uh, Sagulasa, uh, and that's really soon to become the Night Lord's home, the Lion and, and Conrad Kurz kind of have this parlay where they, they talk things over because they had been having this kind of skirmishing back and forth, um, nothing really kind of coming of it, but they, they go on this planet to talk things out. And on the planet, they, they are accompanied by their honor guard. There's Alejos and Corswain for the Lion, and there's Shang and Sevatar to Conrad Kurz. But both get in this kind of brutal melee. They get they immediately get to, to exchanging blows. And it's written out by Aaron Dembski Bowden in one of his uh, many uh, Night Lord books. But he goes into pretty much like the very eloquent way in which uh, Conrad Kurz is very aware of his, I guess you could say, shortcomings as, as this kind of super being that's meant for war. 
Um, he calls himself a savage weapon. It's re it's really, really kind of like, ooh, ooh. It's like savage weapons, one and all. Too dangerous to be wielded without cost. That is all history will see of us. Like, he, he's this very kind of dark, um, sinister individual, but uh, because he knows his fate. He knows um, what he is. And Lionel Johnson and him get in this, this brutal melee. And Conrad almost chokes out Lion before Cor Corswain eventually stabs Kurz through the back. And, and Alejos is uh, killed by Sevatar trying to hold off the, the two uh, Night Lord, uh, Night Lord uh, uh, Honor Guard. So it's just this very terrible moment here where the two Primarchs have to be literally pried apart from each other and dragged back to their respective legions to kind of sit down and say, hey guys, you gotta stop. But both legions kind of fight in this bloody stalemate all throughout uh, three, five years or so in this crusade. And around this time, Lion does a lot of things on the side. You know, he reinstates Librarius, and this directly conflicts with the Edict of Nikea. And this is the uh, an edict that the Emperor kind of said, "Hey, I forbid the use of psychers because it'll draw demons." No, no, no. Uh, but Lion, the Lion eventually finds out that the only way to fight demons on equal ground is with psychers. So he kind of reinstates them and says, "This is a necessary evil. I'm sorry." But it was just very rare for someone who would unflinchingly follow the Emperor's word unto death. But that's just kind of a side thing that's worth bringing up because it's a very character-breaking moment for the lion. Eventually, though, the lion kind of launches this uh, devastating surprise attack on the Night Lords, and he utilizes this utilizes a uh, Xenos piece of technology called the Tuchulcha. And there's a whole side story about how he gets the Tuchulcha, and again, that's not really worth bringing up because it doesn't go into a ton about who he is as a person. There's a whole side story about him interacting with Perturabo um, about some certain siege pieces. Again, not overly important to hit to Lion as a whole, so I, I've, I have um, neglected those and left those out. If you do know of those stories, um, that's why I left those out. <laughs> but this effectively broke the back of the Night Lords. It, it, Lion destroys fourth, a fourth of the entire Legion and mortally wounds uh, Kurs. And there's this really cool... <clears throat> part in the books where it talks about how uh, Kurz is basically like interred on this this med table kind of holding on to life and Sevatar uses his psychic his latent psychic abilities to shock him back to life and they go and basically ram the uh, the Dark Angel's flagship it's a pretty crazy moment and from this the <clears throat> Atramentar which are the the elite terminators of the of the Night Lords they all storm the invincible reason, reason the, the Dark Angel flag, flagship, and they're they're going through everything, trying to uh, find uh, Lionel Johnson and kill him because Kurz is is pretty pissed off that he was he was dealt a quite a mortal blow. And eventually, they end, they actually end up getting captured by the Dark Angels as they uh, they whittle apart all of the uh, the attacking force. So basically, you've got these imprisoned Night Lords on the invincible reason. And you've got the Night Haunter, you've got Conrad Kurz himself, who has stashed himself now in the bowels of the Invincible Reason, just kind of hiding out and killing off crew members and the such. So the Lion goes on like the six-week hunt trying to find Kurz throughout his ship. And eventually they land in the Imperium Secundus. So there's this large ruin storm that's waging, raging across the entire uh, galaxy, and it's preventing people from getting back to Terra. It's cutting them off. The light of the Astronomicon is 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 hindered, and that's what's guiding people guides pe guides people back home. So, the Blood Angels, the Dark Angels, and the Ultramarines kind of rally together at Imperium Secundus, which is essentially Macrag, which is the home of the uh, of Ultramar, the capital of Ultramar, which is the the of course the system of the Ultramarines. And in this, the Lion is made the Lord Protector. And there's a lot of ish, er, instances where the Night Haunter actually gets off of the Invincible Reason and starts harassing McCrag and starts doing a lot of things where he almost outright kills the lion and outright kills, uh, uh, it's really hard to pronounce his name for me, uh, Robbie Gooley, so I'm going to call him, uh, Robert Gulliman, and he almost kills both of them. But what happens is, the lion kind of gets crazed and, and, and incensed and, and, and dedicated to killing off 
the Night Haunter, and there's a lot of back and forth action here. He ends up capturing him at one point, brings him to this whole trial of the triumvirate, what's he call it, what's, what is what it's called, with all three Primarchs there. He's got to he's got to be dealt with, and the Night Lord kind of he kind of defends his stance pretty well here, and they say, you know, hey, you got to go, Lion. You you've done too much. You've gone you've gone insane with this. So they kind of exile Lionel Johnson, the other two Primarchs. And he comes back at the last minute, right before they're about to execute Conrad, and says, hey, if he can see the future, which Conrad does have that ability, and he sees that he dies at, a, at the hands of an assassin sent by the Emperor, then the Emperor is alive, and we are now all heretics. It's basically what he just tells, he tells the, other two, the other two Primarchs who, who go, oh, you're right. And Sanguinius has premonitions as well. Sanguinius goes, you're right too. I, I know I'm supposed to die a, wholly different, a totally different way. What am I thinking? So that's the abridged version of what happens. It's, it's, it's a much more drawn out and obviously more expansive uh, situation. But what happens from then on is that Sanguinius and uh, the, the Ultramarines try to make a break for Terra. And of course, the Blood Angels get there in, in not their entirety, but Sanguinius gets there enough to aid the Emperor in kind of the final fight. And we'll go into Sanguinius's hand in that when we get to Sanguinius. But... Dark Angels go on this kind of crusade of their own, and they go and attack every single homeworld of all of these heretics, of all of these these traitor legions, and they eradicate them. That's why you you don't hear anything about these guy the, the traitor legions going back to their homeworld and their fully fully established systems. No, they went and waged waged their own war and destroyed everything. So for the most part, they did their own kind of behind the scenes work. And that's very indicative of the Dark Angels. They are very behind the scenes. But eventually Lionel Johnson goes to make his way back to Caliban. And we remember at Caliban, Luther is there. Luther is waiting. Luther has been supposedly rebuilding the, the Legion, sending new recruits out. But the second they get into, into the system, they're immediately shot on. Immediately. And we, we haven't gotten to this point in the Horus Heresy, so we don't know how expansive this is going to get. But from the older, older, older stories and the older, older codexes, we know that this breaks out in this giant orbital warfare where Luther is trying to bring Lionel Johnson down. Lionel Johnson is smashing apart the defenses of Caliban. And he gets on to the, the planet, and Luther and Lionel Johnson have this titanic melee, this, this giant kind of um, fighting that, that very much echoes the Emperor and Horus. And eventually Luther kind of uses a psychic ability or some sort of ability that mortally wounds Lionel Johnson. And it, when in doing so, this kind of releases a haze from him because he's been corrupted by chaos wholly now. He's been empowered by chaos to the point where he can actually reach Lionel Johnson's level. So he is on that same kind of Primarch level. And that's something that we see here as a repeating motif across the Horus heresy. Horus is ascended to the level that he can now compete with the God Emperor after, um, well, there's a whole side thing about that. I'll go that into Horus's video because it's a really cool part about what, what causes that. But <clears throat> with Luther and Lionel Johnson, this, this releases this haze from Luther where he's like, oh my God, what have I done? And Lionel Johnson kind of um, gets, gets the rest of the monastery that they're fighting and falls over both of them. And... Uh, Caliban is constantly bombarded by the Dark Angels fleet to the point where the, the the whole entire planet starts to crack and fall apart and not really explodes, but just kind of destroys itself. And the, the Dark Angels find Luther and he's kind of mumbling to himself in madness saying that the, that the Watchers in the Dark took Lionel Johnson. They'll have him for, they'll, they'll bring him back at the end times, which is, again, Something that we're going to see with a lot of these Primarchs is the Arthurian legend of when they need him most, he shall cometh back. And it's gonna, that's going to happen, I promise, guys. He's not the first to hear about this. And the Watchers in the Dark take Lionel Johnson below what is called the Rock, what is, what is the largest piece of Caliban left, which becomes a fortress monastery of the Dark Angels. And it's fitted with warp engines so it can actually traverse the galaxy. But deep down in the... Uh, the Rock resides Lionel Johnson. And the kind of the big secret behind the Dark Angels is that they did have a, a schism, that they did have a betrayal, where Luther led a portion of the Legion against 
the other the rest of the legion so this is a secret that is suppressed from the rest of the imperium no one knows about this that's like as you climb the ranks of the dark angels you start to find out more and more and more you're you're given more as you include yourself into different circles and those circles are actually from the knightly orders as well so this is that that origin kind of seeping into their legion as a whole their space marine chapter as a whole but what we find out here is that as the higher you go up, the more they say, okay, well, hey, now that you're grandmaster of the of the chapter, the lion may or may not be dead in stasis somewhere, may or may not be dead somewhere in stasis below the rock. But don't tell anyone, you son of a bitch, because only the chapter master knows that. And it's kind of like with Robo Gilman of the, uh, uh, Robo Girly Man, as, as, as I've also heard, of uh, the Ultramarines, he's in stasis, kind of like waiting. And we know that he's now come back to life in the 8th edition. So maybe we'll see him here with the 8th edition. I've heard a lot of rumors. I've seen some suspected army lists uh, um, or, and stats of him coming back to life. Maybe we'll see Sanguinius. Who knows? Maybe even Lehman Russ. But a lot of the, the um, loyalist Primarchs had very enigmatic and mysterious deaths. Or deaths that were just kind of like, he'll come back when we need him, I promise. So maybe we're going to see that with Lionel Johnson. So... One thing I do want to cover before we end our video here is the kind of dichotomy between the Night Lords and the Dark Angels. There's a lot of parallels. The Dark Angels are all about justice and duty. <clears throat> on, the end of that, on the other end of that coin, the Night Lords are about justice being inflicted through fear, whereas obviously the Dark Angels are inflicted through martial, um, martial law for the most part. Like they, they, they actually inter, or I'm sorry, uh, inflict martial law upon a uh, planet of Macrag just to go and find. Uh, I'm sorry, of Ultramar, just to go and find Conrad Hurt. So they're they're very much about this militant, kind of disciplined approach to justice, and, and things are very black and white, it almost seems. But with the uh, the Night Lords, of course, it's all about fear and 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 fear mongering and terroring and terror. But the Night Hunter and the uh, and Lionel Johnson fight a whole lot. They fight a ton, but it's kind of funny that they both kind of have this kind of similar end. Conrad Kurz goes back to his his home and sees the same kind of not necessarily the same kind of thing, but almost like a betrayal of the the founding notions of the Legion and destroys his homeland. He destroys his entire home planet. So it's a very interesting kind of end to both of these legions that that kind of uh, revolve around each other so much during the Horus Heresy. It's very interesting. The Dark Angels now have this dark past that they have to atone for. They, they call themselves the Unforgiven. This is the name that they've given to themselves and the rest of their successor chapters. Um, and they essentially have to find the fallen angels. These are the angels that followed Luther during his kind of grand betrayal of the Dark Angels, of the chapter itself, of the Legion itself. So uh, the librarians of the Legion are actually charged with getting the repentance of these fallen angels. And one of those fallen angels is Cypher. He's probably the, the most well-known of the fallen angels. And it's even rumored that he is uh, Zariel, who we've talked about before. And he's maybe even imbued with one final mission by the lion to uh, to do. There, there's another talk that the sword on his back is the lion sword, the sword of Lionel Johnson. And uh, as part of repentance, as part of his kind of grand mission, he has to bring this sword to the emperors, to the golden throne, and uh, essentially atone for all of the unforgiven and the fallen angels at one time. Like say, hey, listen, this is what we've done. And there's a part actually in the uh, in the new eighth edition that talks about how uh, Cypher helps break G Girly Man out of uh, the fate Karos Faith Weaver's prison. And he says, hey, I'm going to do this, but you have to let me go and have an audience with the Emperor. And Girly Man says, yeah, sure, and then eventually kind of imprisons him. But Cypher being Cypher, who is this kind of like the ultimate get-out-of-jail-free card type individual, gets out of prison. But this gives you at least an idea of, of the level of clandestine activities that the Dark Angels have to ensue or have to uh, pursue. Definitely a very secretive part, CAA-type part of the uh, Dark Angels. And uh, it gets you a pretty crazy idea of, of what this Legion's like and where its kind of roots come from. And now when you play the Space Marine ch chapter of Dark Angels, you get a lot of that kind of mystery, but also that disciplined fighting force that you get from their army book and their codex when you read through it. But hopefully this gave you guys a really good idea of um, Lionel Johnson. There was a lot packed in this video, and I tried to condense it down as much as possible to make it... Um, 
understandable because there again you, you there's books and books and books on Lionel Johnson and then there's multiple editions multiple of editions of the codexes so hopefully I did a good job condensing this here for you um, I do apologize if I cleared my throat a little too much here and there I am still just kind of getting over a sickness but I, I'll try to edit the most of it out but if you guys have any questions about Lionel Johnson, about Caliban, about Conrad Kurz, about anything that I've talked about in this video, do go ahead and let me know in the comments. I'm more than happy to help out. Or if you want to, if there's a, the next primer you're clamoring to hear about, go ahead and uh, make a suggestion and I'll probably listen to it and do that as the next one. But uh, thanks for watching here today, guys. Looking forward to uh, continuing this series. Have a good one and take care.